Welcome everyone to today's launch of the Royal Society's report entitled The Online Information Environment, Understanding How the Internet Shapes People's Engagement with Scientific Information. I'm Frank Kelly, a mathematician from the University of Cambridge and the chair of the Royal Society's working group for the report. We're sorry that a family emergency has prevented Gina Neff from being with us and she has our best wishes. I'm joined by two other distinguished members of the working group, Melissa Terrace and Vince Cerf, whom I will introduce more fully a little later. I'll begin with a few words about the Royal Society and an overview of our report. The Royal Society is the UK's National Academy of Sciences. Its fundamental mission, set out in its founding charter from the 1600s, is to promote science for the benefit of humanity. Reflecting this mission, its policy activities on data and digital technologies seek to advance these areas of science and technology for the benefit of society. For science, the online information environment has brought huge advantages. For example, in the current pandemic, the genome sequence of a novel coronavirus could be shared quickly and widely, and this supported the rapid scientific response. But misleading and false information is also shared online in large volumes, both unintentionally by some and maliciously by others. Misinformation isn't a new problem. Misinformation problems are in part irreducibly political and social in nature, and in free and diverse societies, we will always have some version of them. They've been present throughout history, and the report's foreword contains a strikingly relevant fragment from George Eliot's 19th century novel, Middlemarch. The report reviews the spread of misinformation about water fluoridation and vaccination in the 20th century. But what has changed with the advent of the modern information environment, enabled by the internet, the World Wide Web, and social media, is the scale and speed of the spread of misinformation. This is a a significant and a broad topic. Reflecting the expertise of the Royal Society, the focus of this report is, is on examples of scientific misinformation, including 5G, fluoride, vaccine and climate conspiracies, and the role of science and technology in the spread and prevention of misinformation. Our report is clear that misinformation is causing real world harm. Unvaccinated people in hospital wards, 5G masks being burned down, too little action to tackle climate change. However, our report does not recommend removing misinformation. We found little evidence that forcing major platforms to remove offending content will limit scientific misinformation's harms, and it could drive it to harder to address corners of the internet and exacerbate feelings of distrust in authorities. I should add here, we're not talking here about illegal content, hate speech, threats, terrorist content, where content removal can be effective and necessary. We're talking about the area of misinformation that's uh, potentially harmful, but, but not illegal. But attempting to, to remove misinformation would also hinder science. Science stands on the edge of error. It's a process of dealing with uncertainties, prodding and testing received wisdom. Science challenges us to continually assess and revise our understanding of the world. What we believed 100 years ago has been replaced with new knowledge. Some, some people think science is absolute and when it corrects itself, it is somehow not to be trusted or believed. We must work to help people recognize that the core ability to correct itself is a strength not a weakness of the scientific method. It is important that misinformation is tackled effectively, but there is no silver bullet for addressing this challenge. The report therefore recommends implementing a range of interventions involving government, technology companies, and academic institutions to combat misinformation. Uh, before I introduce Melissa and Vint, let me uh, let everyone know that the audience can submit questions via Slido at any point during the event, and a link to that will be in the chat. Um, and as many as we can will be discussed following the initial discussion. So now I'll introduce the two working group members who are about to discuss the report. So Professor Melissa Terrace is a leading international figure in the field of digital humanities. 
She is Professor of Digital Cultural Heritage at the University of Edinburgh and is the Director of the Centre for Data, Culture and Society. Dr. Vint Cerf is widely known as one of the fathers of the internet. Vint is the co-designer with Bob Kahn of the TCP IP protocols and the basic architecture of the internet. He is currently Vice President and Chief Internet Evangelist at Google, where he contributes to global policy development and the continued spread of the internet. So welcome, Melissa and Vint, and over to you, Melissa. Thanks very much, Frank, and all behind the scenes at the Royal Society too. It's a real delight to be here this evening speaking with Vint about the report which was launched today about the online environment. I was really pleased to be part of that working party. Vint and I are going to be chatting for the next half an hour or so, and then we'll go over to audience questions. So do please put any questions over into the Slido, the link's there in the chat while we chat. Okay, Vin, I'm going to start off with a question about the history of the internet and the World Wide Web, which is now over 30 years old. While misinformation in society isn't new, it's become a real pressing current issue for the online environment. I just wonder, could we have predicted when the World Wide Web was set up that misinformation would be such a problem for us? And would we have done anything differently if we'd known that at the start? So that, of course, this is a question we might ask Tim Berners-Lee as well as the author of the World Wide Web. Uh, to be honest with you, I don't think that the question arose, certainly not during uh, the early days of uh, Internet's evolution, which, which begins way back in the 1970s. Um, however, if we had asked the question, I think we might reasonably have concluded that the problem uh, would occur or could occur for the same reason that it, had, it has occurred in other media, especially broadcast media, whether it's radio and, and television, we know those have immediacy. So does the, the uh, newspapers, which are published, you know, roughly speaking, on a 24-hour basis, which is not bad delay. I mean, it's not quite the same as milliseconds. So, so the answer is humanity hasn't changed. We still watch Shakespeare plays for the same reason that we watched them 400 years ago. Um, but uh, did I think about it? No. Um, honestly, I didn't because I was so focused, as many of my colleagues were, on the utility and benefit of being able to share useful information. The problem is that uh, we neglected to remember that there are people who take these platforms and abuse them for their own purposes or do so, as Frank points out, uh, unintentionally, uh, but still spreading misinformation. And by the way, I can't resist a, a little side uh, comment about Frank's wonderful speaking voice. I could listen to that for hours. And so, Frank, if you are looking for a second career, you might consider uh, either radio or television broadcasting because you have a really fabulous speaking voice. Thanks, Finn. Yeah, it, it, misinformation is something which is, I'm going to use the word endemic and to society. And it's something that we, we see, right? You, you can get examples right the way back to classics and we can look at how people are trying to politicize information and to use the truth as something to be weaponized or something to persuade. Um, and this is something that I think that we are seeing online, but the moment that we're in just now with scientific information and how it's being corralled online and why specific areas are really subject to this targeting, whether that's malicious or whether it's just through people's concerns. Why do you think some topics are more vulnerable to misinformation than others? I you think this is actually an evolutionary uh, indication. Uh, think for a moment about warnings and how important they are for our survival. So if somebody says, it's a bear. Uh, and and the you know reaction is run like hell uh, as opposed to gee I wonder what species the bear is I wonder if it has any uh, siblings or and you know we don't analyze things like that we run and the people who didn't run uh, who were too contemplative didn't survive to contribute to the gene pool so now let's think about warnings for a second we know that they have a, an important survival component to them that's why malicious use of misinformation is so dangerous because it is used to trigger people's warning reactions. Uh, this stuff is dangerous. Uh, vaccines cause uh, autism. Uh, you know, the uh, 
the, the uh, vaccines that were uh, produced in uh, record time to deal with the COVID-19 pandemic uh, were done so quickly that they couldn't possibly be uh, you know, correct. Or, or, and you know, these are all warning related uh, uh, assertions. And so we ingest those uh, because more easily because we don't think about them as much. It's a warning. And so you react to that. That's one thing. Now, there is another, uh, e perhaps uh, even more uh, pernicious element here, and it, it relates to the conspiracy theory uh, problem. And I don't fully understand why people are so, um, uh, let's say, uh, uh, susceptible to conspiracy theories. But, but you can see the dynamic. They don't want you to know this. This is a secret. I'm going to share it with you. The other people don't know this, but this is privileged information and it's for your own safety. And so we're back to the warning thing. But the conspiracy part um, is somehow mesmerizingly attractive. Oh, yes, governments have secrets. Uh, other people have secrets. And, and I'm now privileged to know the secret. And so it's a forbidden fruit. And it's very attractive. And all of those dynamics tell me, and I think they tell us uh, as the committee, that we need to understand a lot more about why misinformation and disinformation has such appeal. Um, as scientists, of course, we have a huge responsibility, and the committee, I think, uh, would agree, to, uh, to exactly defend against the pollution of knowledge with deliberate misinformation or even accidental misinformation. And as Frank points out, science is all about discovering better and better models of the real world. And what we learn, as you know, from time to time is that the model that we had and held closely for many years might turn out to be um, uh, inadequate to explain new measurements and new, and new discoveries. And good scientists will say, okay, my theory wasn't as good as it needs to be. This evidence tells me I need to generate new theories. But there are some people who cling to the old theories. And as Frank pointed out, and as the report points out, um, it is, uh, it's hard to give up that which you thought was true. And in the scientific world, we're taught to be prepared to do that. The general public may be less inclined because that takes work. And it also requires you to admit that you might have been wrong. And some people don't like that. Thanks, that's a, a very detailed question. It, it seems to me like there is an issue of ownership and ownership of the information environment that some of this is about people reclaiming ownership over what they understand, what they want to promote, what they want to actually um, engage with, especially around conspiracy theories. But it's interesting to me that you said that we have to understand more about it, which then involves the psychology of all this. And this is why we need to work in an interdisciplinary manner to begin to tackle this. My own background is in library and information science and thinking about how best we can share information. And I work a lot with trusted um, repositories. We'll come on to that in a minute. But actually understanding how information flows through society depends on social scientists and psychologists as well as talking to scientists who are trying to get the findings of what they are doing out which can change right good science changes and develops and is reframed all the time and that's the nature of scientific inquiry and some of this is all about the changing online environment how it's information is changing that underlines all this and then how we persuade people that the change is okay and the change isn't part of the conspiracy and the psychology of that and how we can work with the Royal Society and other learned societies to make people aware that the change in science can be good and it isn't actually a sense flux is a natural state when it comes to science um, and it fascinates me this idea of interdisciplinary research and how if we're going to crack this it is about working with a whole range of people from the academy a whole range of people from industry and a whole range of people from government because what we're seeing just now is some very clever and astute maneuvers 
from people who have understood the psychology and are using it for monetization whether that's deliberate or not whether it's um, whether they've just stumbled across things about ab testing or whether they've actually understood what's happening in people's heads or society is you know that can be argued but we're seeing certain things happening to our democracy to our economy because of misinformation so it behooves us all not just for the science but to understand the wider ramifications of how this is flown through i want to um just bring us to the one of the central points of the report, which is about cautioning against removal of misinformation. And this is one of the things that's been picked up today in a lot of the coverage of this report that the Royal Society has said, no, we're not saying delete everything. We're not saying that um, governments and platforms should be made to delete misinformation but we should not rely on content removal as a solution because that would just drive it to other bits of the internet and fractured communities, which we will not be able to engage with. Instead, the report calls for better access to data for researchers. It calls for demonetizing misinformation so that people can't profit off it and using algorithms to deprioritize misinformation and what people see. From your experience working with industry, how can we get major tech players to take these issues seriously and think about their own actions, given it might mean that their profits are going to come down around this area? Well, first of all, remember that some of the motivations for injecting either misinformation or disinformation or algorithms that, uh, that to promote the wrong thing uh, are not necessarily all pecuniary. Uh, some of them have to do with manipulation, which you implied earlier with regard to uh, political uh, manipulation. We see this all the time, frankly, unfortunately, in our own elections here in the US where external sources have tried to manipulate uh, public sentiment and public opinion. Uh, so with regard to removal, one of the reasons that removal may not work is that uh, the other parties uh, whose information might have been removed, will use that to say, see, they removed it because they don't want you to know this. I mean, we're back to, uh, to this. The second thing is a kind of double entry bookkeeping. Uh, in a good bookkeeping system, you don't remove stuff. What you do is you put in reversing transactions so you can see everything. And so if in fact there is misinformation or factual error, the best way to do that is to say so, not by removing the content, but by uh, describing what the error is, uh, and then helping people discover both the misinformation and the correcting information at the same time. So uh, uh, a number of, uh, of companies, including uh, my own, have worked hard to reinforce the uh, discovery of what we hope is good quality information from sources that uh, have earned trust. And so in the case of, of the pandemic, for example, uh, we turned to the Center for Disease Control or uh, other uh, authorities uh, to provide information to people who are worried about the pandemic. Um, and that's something we can do, but I think removal um, is, uh, is counterproductive uh, for a number of different reasons. And it's just about the fact that, you know, we want to be in a democracy where people should be able to say what they're thinking or feeling in a legal framework well, and a legal manner as well, that we, sh we shouldn't be having these government mandated closures of discussions as well. I, well, you know, I'm a big fan of freedom of speech living in the United States where it's amendment number one, uh, but it says the government is not permitted to suppress uh, information. On the other hand, there is such a thing as introducing content which is harmful. It might not yet be illegal. This raises a very interesting question about uh, who needs to understand the dynamics of all this. And that includes the legislators who need to understand this, but the general public needs to understand it too. And the one thing that we have learned, I think anyway, uh, is that um, people will respond better to discovery that they've been fooled. People don't like to be fooled. You know, fool me once, uh, shame on you. Uh, fool me twice, shame on me. And so if you explain to people what has happened, sometimes that will be a better uh, tactic than simply trying to remove things or simply by asserting something that's wrong. So we have work to do. And if I could go back to your earlier comment, I have long believed that we should have psychologists, sociologists, biologists, and neurologists uh, participating 
in this discussion about misinformation and disinformation because it is a very important uh, part of all of this complexity is human behavior. And, and so we need those disciplines in addition to whatever technical things that we could do uh, with the various platforms that provide the information. Thanks, yeah, I think un understanding human behavior, understanding the legal frameworks, understanding the ethical frameworks, and ethical frameworks are often very different from the legal frameworks, and keeping up with the pace of change around all these things. This is something that the scientific community really need to be grappling with, especially to get their own messages out and to be able to communicate the results of science in today's online environment. Um, I wondered if you've got any, any thoughts on the ethical aspect of this and how we can persuade especially um, major technological providers to think about it in ethical terms and misinformation and why ethically that's wrong for society. We all want a society where people flourish. We all want a society which is good for people. And if misinformation is doing these damages to health and, and to bonds in society, what's the ethical lever that we can pull or the lever about ethics to encourage people to take this more seriously? Well, uh, for one thing, people who uh, create the algorithms and programmers who write software need to be told that people are going to rely on their software. And the more they rely on it, the more important it is that it works reliably, that it's safe and secure, it pr it protects privacy and confidentiality, and, and it isn't harmful. So there's a, that is an ethical component that needs to be taught to people who produce the technology that we're relying on every day. Um, there's also um, a, a related um, ethical issue uh, having to do with the security of software. Um, I mean, we all know about ransomware, for example, causing great harm. That's not the topic that this report pursued particularly, but I bring it up because the reason it works is that the software has bugs and uh, we haven't figured out how to write software with no bugs. And so there's an ethical um, uh, imperative uh, when you're producing software that is going to be released and used by uh, widely, uh, that you work really, really hard to avoid the bugs and have a method for fixing them if they show up. And so that's an ethical responsibility, I think, uh, that, that people should have. Now, there is a general public responsibility here as well, and, and it requires work, and that's called critical thinking. This is the essence of, uh, of science, and um, you know where we where we ask what are our theories predicting? What do our measurements tell us? How well did they match up? And if they don't, what's to be done? Uh, that's a form of critical thinking. We need to teach everyone, young people and adults, that critical thinking is their friend. But we have to remind them that it takes work to do that. Where did this information come from? Is there corroborating evidence for assertions that are being made? Is someone trying to convince me of something that I don't want to be convinced of? What motivations are there behind the information that I'm being shown? Uh, all of those are, are important questions that we would like people to ask themselves, but it's going to take work to get the general public to adopt that. The scientists do that because that's part of their scientific method, but the general public needs to do it too. Thanks. I did my computing science degree in the 1990s, and I, I don't remember us ever dealing with any ethical issues in that. It was a kind of intensive, you know, how to program and how to make stuff happen. But actually thinking about the implications of what we're doing, I know that is changing. Obviously, I, I work at university and I know that is changing now. And I know that we, the next generation of folks coming through are being taught ethics and we are actively writing this into courses. So hopefully, as the generations come through, we, we realise more in the round that this is a crucial part of education and folks coming through. From an information science side, we have a, a concept which is information literacy, which is treat, uh, teaching these critical information practices and how you figure out where a bit of information has come from, how you ascertain whether it is true or not or it can still be interesting and useful even if it isn't true but actually figuring out the very of this and 
making sure that you understand everything about that. And it's a core skill in library and information sciences. It's a core skill in cataloging for things going into library systems. And it's something that we teach our librarians or people that are learning to be a librarians as to how to make sure that library users can tell this stuff. It strikes me that this is such a big and crucial component that we should really be starting to teach this at a much earlier age and especially working with governments to make sure that we're starting to teach people about online information environment right from primary school here, here in the UK and making sure that this critical thinking is deeply embedded into everything we do. I'm aware though that that basically means that we're saying not to trust anything right from the start. And um, I want to come to the, the aspects of, you've talked about misinformation. Let's talk about trust and in information. And the flip side of misinformation is trustworthy information. So what do you think the role of the scientific community is now about ensuring that trustworthy information is promoted? So there are several uh, things that, uh, that we discussed uh, as we were uh, shaping this report. Uh, I will label one of them provenance in the sense of where did the information come from that led to a particular conclusion or assertion or, or perhaps even a proof. Uh, and in order for a scientist, and maybe even for the general public, to uh, assess the quality of information, they need to know where did it come from. And so that's important. But then there's a second thing, and it has to do on the scientific side, especially. Uh, if you run an experiment and you reach conclusions which you publish, it seems to me very important to uh, provide enough information so that you could run the experiment, someone else could run the experiment again, which means a lot of metadata. What instrumentation was used? How was it calibrated? Uh, what reagents were used? Uh, what is the raw data that you got that I could process? Uh, and so that kind of information uh, leads to an opportunity to do not just trust, but to verify. And if you remember Ronald Reagan's uh, Doverai no Proverai, uh, which is trust but verify. The scientists are well uh, uh, informed to do that or well advised to do that, as is the general public. And that's our, that is really the key here. It is verifying information to, if you want to trust it, you need to verify it. What are the indicia of, uh, of trusted sources? I would say that they are sources that have demonstrated their ability to correct error uh, and, as opposed to hiding it. And so we turn to scientific uh, publications, for example, that, that have shown willingness and ability uh, to make corrections where these are, are called for, or, or publish articles that refute earlier results uh, on the basis of, of new evidence. Uh, so evidence-based thinking is critical uh, to all of this. And I believe that, uh, that in our report, uh, we are articulate on this point. Thanks. And the report also stresses the important role of open access, open science, open licensing and reproducible research, but encouraging access to information and data, the underlying data, which allows information and knowledge to be created. Um, is there more that we could be doing about promoting the benefits of open access and open data and to encourage other people to be actually going back to the sources and to be actually looking at the, those themselves? Well, there are a variety of things that we could be doing. Uh, one of them, of course, is to preserve the uh, algorithms and software and so on used to uh, undertake an experiment so that others would have access to it. Preserving and having access to data and metadata uh, for reproduction of, of results is also uh, important. Uh, I think that um, we also have a, a, an interesting challenge with regard to preservation. Uh, historically, uh, a lot of data has been lost because no provision was made to, to keep it in perpetuity or at least for a long enough period of time. I'll give you a small example recently. Um, the, uh, the, uh, the Jeremy Collar Foundation uh, provided funding in order to digitize whale songs that had been recorded on uh, audio tape and were disintegrating. And that information is still valuable today for people who are trying to understand, you know, what is the meaning of that, of the signals that the whales are producing. 
So digitizing the information was a way of preserving it longer. We, we need to give serious thought to how to preserve information over longer periods of time because re-examination of scientific data often reveals new results. Uh, examples are the discovery of planets uh, orbiting other stars in other galaxies, let alone our own. And now more recently, even a moon orbiting a planet, orbiting the sun in another, uh, another part of our galaxy. Uh, that's res uh, the result of applying higher uh, capacity computing capability and machine learning which are relatively new tools that can be applied to older information to yield new results. That's really interesting. I, I just want to make a reminder to everyone listening that um, if you've got any questions about this, do pop them in Slido. We'll pick them up in about 10 minutes time. Um, my own area is on the digitization of the past and how we can extract information from that. There's a lot of interest, for example, in citizen science, looking at shipping records and understanding weather, the project called Old Weather, if you want to look it up online, um, understanding migratory patterns of birds from looking at bird watchers over the past 200 years and understanding then and doing computational modeling over how that's changed and the effect of climate change on migration patterns. So there is a link very much between the digitization of the past, citizen science and current science and making sure that we're looking after that information. And I just want to shout out to my, my crew in like digital libraries who are doing fantastic work on trying to save the current online environment for the future, in particular places like the Internet Archive and here in the UK, the UK Web Archive, and often with very little resources, but putting together these repositories of digital information. Unfortunately, what we see is that they're not often not allowed to share that digital information openly because of the legal frameworks that are put in place. So we're in a situation where we do have expertise, but we can't share because of the copyright frameworks. And it's a really wicked problem in that people can share misinformation online, but we can't share um, for example, if I won't name political parties, but if uh, political parties change the website overnight and say they never said something, there's a copy of that in the UK web archive. But you're only allowed to see that if you go into one of the six legal deposit libraries in the UK and actually look it up. Um, you can't see that online. Um, so we're galloping away, the internet's changing, but the regulations about what we're allowed to save and store within our very trusted institutions are kind of caught in a legal framework which is about print um, and there's a real moment here where we have to get together as scientists, as information scientists, as librarians, as politicians, as publishers and go wait a minute we can help combat misinformation with these stored repositories if we can figure out a way of actually allowing people to use this information that we've stored um, it's a really tricky and thorny problem because of a lot of the monetary flows that follow these things, especially with things like newspapers, they don't necessarily want to give away their whole um, back catalogue of stuff for free online that's been online on their website. You know, I understand all that. Um, there's a whole lot of people we need to get around the table then to help fix this. And one of the things I really liked about this report is the range of organisations involved, the range of recommendations, which is not just, you know, scientists should do this or the government should do that or a library should do this. It's, that it's setting out a range of things that a whole suite of people in society should be doing to tackle it together. So my question to you is, after that little rant, how do we get all these people around the table in a concerted manner to help make the online information environment better for everybody? Well, first of all, we can make strong arguments as you just have about the value of sharing information uh, in, in spite of the fact that there are uh, constraints and limitations under their current legal frameworks. Uh, an example of something that you might consider is that an archive might be given uh, latitude that uh, others might not have for purposes of digital preservation. Uh, and I have to say that digital preservation uh, is not automatic. Uh, that when you uh, capture things in digital form, they're in some format or other. There's software typically needed in order to extract that information usefully. But the question is whether that software will run successfully 100 years from now, or maybe even 20 years from now. 
uh, or uh, or whether uh, you need an operating system to run on a hardware device, which will then run an application, which can then interpret the older data. Do we have to emulate the old hardware in order to make all the old software work? Uh, how do we get access to the source code of the software that's under, uh, if not copyright, then it might be under patent or other constraints. So uh, I think the, you described it correctly that you need to have a variety of viewpoints sitting around the table, trying to figure out how to produce the benefit of preservation and access while recognizing some motivations for access control. And how do we balance that in society's interest uh, will be the substance of the discussion. And I honestly hope that uh, that logic, let's say logic may not count here, but let, it, let us say that the argument of societal benefit, I hope, will carry the day. Because otherwise, we deny ourselves the value of all of the expense of the scientific research that we've done in the first place. That's very persuasive. I'm going to steal that from you and use it. <laughs> use it in future. I think the, the, coming back to you know societal benefit and the, and the the fact of um, you know we are all humans that are discussing this about human society and actually this is about the society that we have built. Not necessarily we haven't necessarily chosen to have built in this way. It's kind of happened organically in some way. But there's a moment now where we could choose the future of this. And it has societal benefit has to be there. My last question to you before we go into the chat and before we actually pick up questions from the audience, I do put your questions in um, the slide away, everybody, um, is there's a whole raft of recommendations in this report. If we're going to go forward, we have to start prioritising. And where would you say, where should we start? Is it getting everybody around the table? Is it thinking about how we actually build that type of infrastructure? Or is there some anything in the report that really jumps out at you as like, this is the crucial moment, this is the thing we should be doing now? Uh, well, let me actually, the, there are so many answers to that question because there are so many different considerations which you've already touched on. So I would say that one thing we should be working on now is the whole digital preservation question uh, in order to make sure that we have put in place uh, legal frameworks that allow for that preservation to take place over long periods of time. Uh, just because it's digital does not mean that it lasts forever or that it will be available when we want it. Uh, the second thing uh, is has, having to do with understanding the nature of misinformation and disinformation and how people's um, views are manipulated. Uh, I think exposing that uh, in a visceral way, having people, at, uh, as you mentioned, the, the sociologists and the psychologists and the neuroscientists, helping people understand the ways in which manipulation can occur, we should get that out in front of everyone, scientists and the general public and especially policymakers. Uh, the third thing that we can do is to encourage tools to be built that will allow us to do the validation and verification of other experiments. How do we make sure that scientists can know about, can discover and get access uh, to information that allows them to undertake that validation? Uh, so it's not as if there's a linear list of things that we should prioritize. I would actually recommend against trying to create such a, a hierarchy, but rather to, uh, to look for um, beneficial results that we can anticipate would, uh, would arise if we tackled some of these problems. Um, I'm particularly concerned, though, about the general public's um, uh, mis, uh, mis, the misleading information that reaches the general public and causes bad decisions to be made that are harmful for everyone, including themselves. This is particularly true when it comes to misinformation about the uh, dealing with COVID-19 and the pandemic, which continues to burn through uh, our countries. Uh, so um, I, I don't think the report was intended to be uh, particularly linear in its uh, treatment but rather to say, please look at these recommendations. And uh, from the perspective, your particular perspective, whether you're a scientist or a policymaker or, uh, or a business person, of those various recommendations, can you take action on any of them in order to contribute to the aggregate result? 
And I think for the same reason that you want a multidisciplinary evaluation of the problems, we need to have a multifaceted response to the problem because different actors have different capabilities uh, and ability to contribute to solutions. Thanks. I'm going to answer my own question and see what I think as well I, about this before we go to the questions. Um, the information literacy issue is one that's huge for me, but it's how we deliver that and how we deliver it in a way that will reach the people that need or need to, yeah, I'm even prescribing that they need to be taught, you know, which is the wrong way to go about it. How we get the message across that information literacy is crucial. How we allow people who are trained to do it and my sector and the library sector, you know, it's been decimated by austerity over the last 10 years. And we're in that perfect storm where the trustworthy institutions have been underfunded for the past 10 years as misinformation has been growing. So there's a lot of people we need to get around the table. There's a lot of people we need to keep talking to each other and we need to find funding and resourcing to allow us to have these conversations, to build up these frameworks and to give grassroots tackling of these issues in the wider society which isn't just about you know the ivory towers which us academics have spent all our time and that was sarcasm by the way if you're looking at a transcript and um, so it's about the impact of our research making sure our research is impactful but also making sure we're communicating in a broad way and taking this out to the wider community and on, on that point about taking to the community i'm going to turn to questions now as to well, what people from the community have actually yes and you can Melissa, for just one moment to just riff off of what you just said um it seems to me that uh concrete examples of of things are always helpful stories are always helpful stories that you can relate to so imagine for just a moment that we put a series of uh skits together uh, in which misinformation is deliberately injected into uh, the dialogue. And, and you show how the parties who wish that misinformation or disinformation to be accepted, how they uh, arrange uh, the, uh, its presentation, its discovery. Uh, and then we you say, do you see what just happened here? And it's almost like, uh, imagine going to a movie where you watch the movie and you enjoy the movie. And then somebody says, would you like to know what the director was thinking uh, while this movie was being made? And there is another version of it where the director has a voice overlay. I can imagine doing these little skits and then having a voice overlay saying, you see what just happened here? They did this and that caused the, the recipient to misunderstand, et cetera. These, these kinds of concrete examples I think would go a long ways to helping people uh, recognize the value and utility of critical thinking, as opposed to simply uh, telling them that they should do that. Yeah, thanks. thanks. I think there's a lot we could do working with people who are experts in, in communication and digital communication in communicating about the online environment. I'm going to go to question one, which is coming from Ralph. Thanks, Ralph. And also, I'm going to might bring um, Frank back in to answer some of these questions too. So question one from Ralph is, how do laymen find out about what other scientists think about a scientific paper? Is there an equivalent of TripAdvisor? Um, Frank, I wondered if you had any um, thoughts on that. I'll, I'll have a go. That is a very interesting question. Um, of course, science is a very broad area, and so uh, one would expect this to happen in each area. And indeed, in mathematics, it has grown hugely. Um, so, for example, the, the blogs of uh, uh, Terry Tao and of, of uh, uh, Tim Gowers are uh, amazingly interesting. Now, I'll put pointers to them in the chat. Um, and that will be interesting, and you may get involved if you're a mathematician. Now, uh, chemists have similar things, and physicists do, and whatever. I, I don't know the, the best place to get into those ones. Um, but the, 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 uh, the question brings to mind another thing that came up in some of the, the interviews that I was doing today. I mean, if you think about uh, trying to take misinformation off or, or to remove it, who decides? How do you decide that? Well, if you think of the scientific process, the scientific process um, that attempts to do this and does it um, as well as it can do 
but it's a very, very uh, time consuming process. A paper is submitted, it has uh, referees that, uh, that take it through peer review. It has uh, editors that look at the referees' reports. There are often disagreements. There's a lot of work gone in before the paper gets published. And so the decision about whether something is right or worth publishing or whether there's a mistake in the way that it's argued or something is really a very, very tricky decision. Um, and you know, the point I was making at the beginning, science uh, works by by having that debate open um, because you're not sure uh, even in something like mathematics where it's where, where you think well it's either true or false well well yeah, may, maybe it, it, it might be either true or false and indeed some things aren't it might be undecidable or, or uh, okay let's not get into a philosophical debate but whether it's true or false may be a matter of debate between the referees and the author for maybe as long as a, a few years before the paper gets published so the decision about what is misinformation or not is not an immediate one um so these these questions are not not that easy to to answer um, um, I'm aware it's, it's my mic still a bit funny. Yes, it has. I'm going to log oh, off and come back oh, in. So okay, I can, can I hand over to you. I'll be back in a sec. Right. Okay. So, so Vin, you might want to uh, jump in at this point. I, I would like to, but I have to tell you that Melissa's uh, audio is uh, totally distorted right now. Yes, she, she's just logged off to uh, to, to relog on. So, okay. um, so, so I actually had great difficulty hearing the question. I enjoyed your answer, but I didn't actually hear the question very well. Oh, well, so the question was, um, how do laymen find out what other scientists think about a scientific paper? Is there an equivalent of TripAdvisor? Yeah. Well, in fact, uh, of course, you uh, described the entire and often very lengthy process. I just wonder whether there aren't technologies that we haven't quite used yet. Uh, that would uh, allow us to have more immediate feedback. Imagine for, uh, uh, as exa an example, that a paper is published and it's available in archive or some other online thing. And we allow um, the scientific community to annotate and comment on the paper. However, um, what you, you don't have 10,000 people commenting, they might want to. Uh, and, and of course, it would be impossible to figure out what was going on. But imagine if you could select among the sources that you might trust to see what their comments are. Suppose that the, the, the documents actually say the following parties have made comments, you know, you, which of them do you want to see? Uh, we might be able to build in mechanisms that would um, expose the dialogue if there's disagreement sooner than the normal process does. Uh, obviously, it's less, it's imperfect. Um, and of course, you get into the Wikipedia situation where people disagree with each other. I would say we could look to Wikipedia as well as an example of a remarkable uh, crowdsourced um, ability to debate uh, factual uh, history or, 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 or specific uh, information. Uh, even though it's not perfect, they've got the Generally, um, general consensus pages and the pages that speak to controversy. And mm -hmm. so I look, look to that as an interesting exercise uh, in trying to deal with misinformation, disinformation, and misunderstanding. Right. So, so Vint, the second question um, uh, that, that's been uh, got lots of upticks <laughs> in, in, in this attempt to use the, 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 <laughs> the internet to, to pick out the uh, uh, the, the better questions. How can we unpick the incentives that drive sharing misinformation online when so many platforms are built around an enraged to engage model? So I think this is a more uh, uh, developing the point about the algorithms and uh, et cetera. So, so this is an interesting ethical question. Uh, and it's conceivable that uh, if the problem of, uh, of these algorithms uh, is exacerbates uh, the propagation of uh, harmful information and the consequences of that. You can imagine uh, going from the jawboning uh, to um, to adjust the algorithms to take that into account to understand them more deeply, as Melissa has uh, has suggested. Uh, you could go from there all the way to the point where some requirements are being uh, levied. Uh, on uh, on the um, platforms that provide access to the information. And I think that debate is uh, literally ongoing as we speak. 
um, finding, uh, I, I tend to prefer getting people to think for themselves, but there may need to be more limitations and constraints um, imposed in order to achieve the objective. I think there are lots of uh, sort of kind of experiments at the moment, and then um, we're learning what works. I, I mean, if, for example, on Twitter, when um, people, if you attempt to, I attempted to forward a uh, or retweet a link the other day to a newspaper article, and was very pleased to say it asked me had I read the article. <laughs> now, in fact, I had. <laughs> I, 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 I rushed to say. <laughs> it's when, when I hope you can hear me better now. I hope that's working. Yeah, yeah, um, it's, but, um, it's when they ask you, have you read the article when you're trying to tweet your own article out and Twitter is like <laughs> trying to put that friction in. Like, are you sure? Do you know what you're talking about? And I, I this kind of mansplaining by social media platform, like literally right, right. Th this is mine. Um, so yeah, the, the idea of friction and where we can, where we can put friction into this process to take the speed or the heat out of sharing things to make sure people have reflected. And it's almost kind of dismantling the, the type of online platforms which have been made organically. If we think about old, old uh, keyboards, you know, they were literally made to stop people typing fast so that the, the levers didn't hit each other. And we've gone through that process with social media. We've got something that works really fast and we need to actually figure out how to slow it down a bit and how to put those brakes in to make sure that people think and people don't jam up the system because it's going too fast. And it's interesting, this idea of friction. And this is where we need UX designers as well as psychologists to come in and go, and this is the point that we should, these are the friction points that would help reflect and to drive these things. So it's uh, the, in, Enraged to engage is really interesting to me, and also the disruption of a concentration and how a lot of these online systems are designed to stop the sustained concentration and sustained thought that you really need to do any form of academic endeavor over a sustained period. And it, they've been designed to disrupt all that, and we need to bring, bring in these frictions again. Um, we've got another question in from Eduardo. So Eduardo asks, sorry, Ben, did you want to come in on that? Right. Yeah, I have, a, I have a response to make here because I think it's very important to understand that every time you introduce mechanisms like this, you introduce an opportunity for abuse. So I'll give you an example. We, we do things at Google using YouTube uh, thumbprints uh, for video and for audio to detect attempts to upload copyright material. Then, yeah, so having done that, now we have people who falsely claim that they have copyright material in order to shut the other people off. So uh, one of the hardest problems I know of is trying to introduce mechanisms of the sort that you're describing and also defend against their abuse. Yeah, yes. yeah it's the cleverness about how you can get around all of these systems and all of these ways of actually anything that's put in place, will, someone will figure out how to get around it, right? And it's a, it's a continual game of almost cat and mouse with, with trying to figure out how to maintain, has to be an active maintaining of an online environment. Um, I'm going to ask Eduardo's question now. Much online censorship we're aware of comes from private companies providing communication platforms. They assert their right to deny use of the platform to people communicating fake news or wrong ideas, not considering that debunking is enough. Can we persuade them to use a better approach? Well, uh, actually, that's going to be hard uh, because uh, sometimes there are legislators who demand uh, removal, for instance, uh, as opposed to uh, demoting uh, or providing counter information, counterfactual information. So, uh, so the answer is that uh, the companies don't always have uh, the freedom to choose because they may be required under regulatory constraints uh, to uh, to respond. So. Uh, uh, I, I still believe in the double entry bookkeeping idea, uh, which is, I think is more um, educational because it shows you why something might be wrong as opposed to simply removing it, in which case you don't know that it's wrong. You don't discover it, you don't discover it at all, but then you may, you may encounter it by some other means and not know that it's incorrect. Thanks, Finn. Um, I'm going to go to what might turn out to be our last question, which is from Jeffrey. Um, 
misinformation has proved to be more exciting than reality, <laughs> then it's six times more seductive. I'm going to say citation needed for that, Jeffrey. Where do you get the six times more seductive? How do we counteract that? You know, uh, Mark Twain uh, was uh, uh, quoted uh, as saying that uh, uh, lies run around the planet three times while the truth is putting its shoes on. And uh, I think that the reason for that is related to my earlier remarks having to do with warnings and our evolved sensitivity to that which sounds like a warning uh, and, and is uh, is is the it, we react to this uh, in thinking about Kahneman's thinking fast and thinking slow. Warnings exercise the thinking fast mechanism, and your suggestion about friction, uh, from my point of view, uh, is to introduce the the slow thinking part to evaluate uh, what it is that we are reacting to, and the difficulty with all of this is that um, once you've triggered the fast reaction, it's hard to undo that. I and mean, once again, we could use psychologists, sociologists, and neuroscientists to help us understand those dynamics um, better so that we might know how to introduce exactly the friction that you were suggesting. I, I, I fear we, we may have to wrap up there. Um, uh, but I, I, I would like to thank very, very much Melissa and Vint for, for the discussion, quite, quite fascinating. Um, a particular point that uh, came up a few times, and you made it very explicitly, Vint, <clears throat> was the multidisciplinary nature of some of these problems and uh, the way in which different uh, disciplines need to work together and uh, to get somewhere. And corresponding to that, the, the need for a multifaceted response. And the report's very clear about the, the need for uh, interactions between fact checkers, scientific academies and technology companies. And of course, in some of these areas concerned with algorithmic amplification, um, some of the, uh, the, the legislation, uh, the, the, then scientists, lawyers and economists need to be able to have a coherent conversation uh, that doesn't cause, for example, scientific misinformation to be treated in a way that's damaging to, to scientific discourse. Um, the, thank you also for the audience for attending and for such interesting and provocative questions of which we've only managed to scratch the surface. Um, the, the report is available for download now on the Ross Society website and a video of tonight's event will be put up there in due course. So if, um, if we had the ability now, I'd ask the audience to, to thank Melissa and Vin for their discussion. So, <laughs> so thank you and uh, goodbye everyone. Thanks so much, Frank. It was a real pleasure to chat. Bye, Melissa. Thanks, Thanks so much. It was a pleasure to chat. I just want to thank everyone at the Royal Society too for their work on the report and also the event today. So thanks to those behind the scenes too.